Okay, so does this work? Uh, you can hear me? Yeah? Okay. And uh, well, first of all, um, I want to thank all the organizers for organizing this meeting. Uh, it looks uh, like a fabulous meeting. I uh, also want uh, to acknowledge that I'm very happy to be here. We mean, honor uh, Alexis. Um, I will say only uh, a few words about, uh, 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 we know each other for many years, I didn't count. Uh, and uh, we had uh, a bunch of interactions uh, um, and uh, they're all very nice. He's a, really a very generous and interesting person who has wonderful results. And uh, um, I am really very honored to be uh, having um, had, several mathematical um, kind of going after each other in various, not in circles, but we, we let's say, make on, on subject that we were both interested in. So, um, and this is one of them. So um, I'll start uh, talking about uh, this uh, subject of regularity and turbulence. So um, <clears throat> the... Uh, these are two important subjects, and essentially the, the message for those of you who want to work on something else now, the message is that uh, they're both serious subjects, and the other message is that it's not necessary to have finite time singularities in order to describe turbulence. Um, so there are several messages of this type. Let's see. Uh, it works. So I will recall here some classical results. I will recall classical results both in math and in turbulence. So I'll start with um, the ways of, of describing turbulence that are minimal. So one of the first and most important uh, parameters uh, is the rate of dissipation of kinetic energy. Uh, there is a minus, so that this rate is, is positive. So this is denoted by epsilon. And uh, uh, this object, if uh, Navier-Stokes are not forced, is balanced. Uh, you apply this averaging procedure uh, mentioned here with braces. We apply it to the Navier-Stokes equations, and you get a balance between the kinetic viscosity, the average of the gradient squared, uh, being the average rate of dissipation of energy. And this is a, um, what Srinivasan uh, called the zeroth law of turbulence, uh, that um, the observed uh, fact, and I'm going to mention a few facts in a second that I explain what I mean by fact, is that this number uh, is uh, time independent and it goes. Uh, as uh, viscosity goes to zero or Reynolds number going to infinity, it's bounded away from zero. So that is invoked often to say that uh, as nu goes to zero, these gradients have to blow up in some way. And it is true. Um, let me already say what I mean by facts. Okay, so the, the, the turbulence is a serious field in which serious people, especially when they were founded many years ago, even in the United States, nowadays maybe they're founded a little bit in Germany, there is an institute in Heidelberg and so forth. So uh, when people were doing fundamental science and they were uh, funded, uh, they did uh, real experiments on various situations. And this is an exempl exemplification of a fact. It's an experimental fact. Um, and we should always, as mathematicians, we know who we are, uh, but we should uh, remember that uh, these, uh, um, when, when we casually refer to turbulence, we should know that there are actual um, a very serious experiments and numerical and, and physical behind them. So another law of turbulence, uh, which I express simply here, is a, a law about displacement. So you take a velocity uh, increments. You say you here plus L minus U there. L is a separation in physical distance. And in average, the square of that, now I, I give you a, be, below a more precise statement, but in average, that goes uh, like the two thirds power of the product between this value and L. So this parameter epsilon is a fundamental parameter that parameterizes turbulence. And uh, this law 
uh, occurs in a range of scales, and the range of scales uh, in physical space extends down to a small quantity, and in wave number space, uh, it extends up to a large quantity, and this is a cutoff quantity, quantity that is determined entirely from the kinematic viscosity and this fundamental parameter, epsilon. So you could guess these things by dimensional analysis, asking yourself, how does, uh, what are the units in new uh, kinematic viscosity? What are the units in a uh, rate of change of energy per mass? And then, you uh, would come up with this uh, answer. A related uh, um, object is the Kolmogorov spectrum. And the Kolmogorov spectrum is that uh, the power spectrum or the, 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 free, the spectrum of the energy at scale K uh, scales like a power law with a parameter epsilon, and the power law is minus phi thirds. In the inertial range, again, it's an inner range up to KD. So these are uh, facts, and I'm going to mention one more, I think, which is the four-fifths law, which is a little more precise version of this, uh, which says that in if you take the increment and you project it in the direction in which you made the increment, so in the direction of L, and you take that object and cube it. Now, it's a scalar object, so you can cube that, take it to the third power, and then take average. You get precisely minus four-fifths, that's the four-fifths law times uh, what you would expect, uh, epsilon times L uh, by dimensional analysis. So it is a law in un assuming homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. You can, uh, making algebraic and statistical assumptions, you can quote unquote derive it precisely. It has been done, of course. Uh, Monin and Yaglom book uh, has it. So um, these are facts of uh, turbulence in the sense that they're observed experimentally to a large degree and numerically to a, an enormous degree. So I want to uh, emphasize, for instance, the validity. Oh, I'm sorry. Can, uh, can I go back? Yes. Uh, how do I go back? Do you, do you have a button for going back? Um, yeah, just watch it. Okay. All right. So thank you. So <clears throat> uh, the example of the uh, Kolmogorov spectrum, I'm a little familiar with that because there was uh, there are many computations. And essentially, it doesn't matter what you do. If you have many scales active and you have a fluid model that has maybe even a little compressibility and it's very, very large scale, uh, this exponent minus 5 thirds pops up. And it's very easy to understand it uh, more or less from the fact that you have a certain balance and you have a quadratic nonlinearity and one derivative and the energy balance makes three velocities divided by one scale. So essentially, you would expect this kind of behavior as just if you have that feature in your flow and it's sufficiently agitated and in equilibrium. Intermittency, that's a, a word that means many things. Uh, in particular, it means uh, exceedingly high gradients of velocity, which are distributed sparsely in space and time. So when we're going to go to map pretty soon, then let me keep on going with this. So another thing it might mean is that the structure functions that are these uh, increments, let's say in absolute value to simplify things, to the power p, where p is not 2 or 3, but any number, they, instead of scaling with a p power of 1 third or you know, uh, the same power every time, uh, they have corrections, and the corrections are not uh, necessarily power laws, and these corrections are uh, intermittency corrections. So alpha sub p, the aggregate number dependence in L, is called zeta p in this uh, um, community. So the increment over scale L scales like zeta to the power p with some prefactors. That, and uh, the corrections are non-zero if you are not in Kolmogorov 41. So uh, Kolmogorov 41 says there is no correction and all powers scale like this and non-zero, these are intermittence corrections. The connection between these two uh, concepts uh, is tenuous. It's not like it's not established, but it is not, uh, let's say, um, at the same level as the observation. So the two observations are independent. They are observations 
of sparsity in space and time of gradients of velocity. And there are observations of corrections, uh, mostly numerical for high random ones. And these are uh, the sparsity are both numerical and physical. So these things are observed if you take a large time. The scale of observation is about the dissipation scale. And the Reynolds number, uh, after taking a long time, the Reynolds number is taken to infinity. Now, the Reynolds number is something that many mathematicians don't understand. Everybody knows how to rescale an equation to get the same coefficients, and everybody talks about that. And that's fine, and there is no contradiction between Reynolds number and rescaling, and everybody knows about how there is this uh, scale invariant measure, uh, scale invariant norms and things like that. They're the same thing as long as you talk about all solutions. But if you talk about classes of solutions, then you distinguish, okay? So the Reynolds number has, let's say that you are in the same box with size L, it has not only the viscosity, but U over N, and then it's relative. So you can think after you rescale, you have to try to think about classes of velocities. Small, large, so Peter, and that, others. In that, in that sense, how many universality classes do you have in mind? So the universality classes is, again, another uh, nice uh, uh, object that uh, um, one can think about. And uh, <coughs> we, uh, we're we not going to. So I don't know. OK. <laughs> all right. So mathematical considerations. And it's worth spending a moment here. First of all, nice words, OK? So uh, theoretically, these things should be expected values with respect to measures in path space, which are robust. I'll have to discuss that in a little bit. Supported on solutions of fluid equations. They should reflect permanent states. And uh, then we should take the infinite Reynolds number limit. So um, I have here some explanation of the words that are a little bit tongue in cheek, OK? So um, before the explanation, I said you have to take long time average. These measures in functional space are long time averages of functionals of solutions of Navier Stokes equations. And then they're followed by a limit of Reynolds number to infinity. Before I go on, there is such a thing. So the theory is not new, not invented now. There is classical hydrodynamic theory by Vishik and Fursikov. And there is classical by Foyash and, and uh, followers. So uh, mostly for situations in which you have enough regularity to define the solutions, but even for 3D as well, for weak solutions, there are there is some theory. The problem is, not, uh, not the problem, but we don't know enough, OK? So uh, the existence of long time averages of solutions, or in the cases in which you add some noise, uh, even their uniqueness is very well understood in some situations. But qualitatively, uh, the limit of uh, Reynolds number to infinity, also some results exist uh, about taking the limit of uh, Reynolds number to infinity formally and or in very good situations. Uh, uh, even I have some results like that, but they're not, um, let's say, they, they are in situations in which the math can be done, but they don't. you don't know uh, really uh, qualitative information. So robust means Maybe stable, but stable to what, you'll ask me, and that, that's the correct question. Permanent means time invariant or time increments should be invariant. So I said support it in permanent state. You are not really uh, discussing transient. Uh, infinite Reynolds number, this is only for mathematicians. Uh, it's viscosity 10 to 0, but you have to keep everything else fixed. OK? So otherwise, you have to understand what you're talking about, the, the various regimes of the Reynolds number, OK? So there are some issues. First of all, clearly, infinite time and uh, infinite Reynolds number limits do not commute. And I say that uh, maybe I've been saying this for, for many years, every year. So uh, but I keep saying it so people can, can uh, hear it. So not only because uh, of um, if there are no forces, but even in force situations. And also, the robustness. Uh, has to do with the fact that was very well known that if you are 
in a turbulent regime, like imagine an experiment, as the most classical experiments are really Taylor experiments in which a fluid is rotated, or uh, um, really, uh, um, sorry, the Rayleigh really Taylor in 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 uh, in Rayleigh really Benar a situation of Taylor queer time and when the fluid is rotated, and Rayleigh really Benar experiments when fluid is heated. So uh, you have situations in which you have laminar states, for instance, if you hit from below, the, the, um, the solution of uh, just transmission, the diffusive solution, it's always a solution, uh, but it's of course unstable, and it predicts certain um, bulk quantities that are wrong. So they are wrong, meaning that they are not observed factually, for uh, strong rotation, so for strong heating, for instance, Nussel versus Rayleigh uh, scales like uh, one third, roughly speaking, and not uh, uh, linearly like in the in the case of uh, stable. So uh, that means that you need to discuss measures and allow to step away from some invariant measures. Because a delta function on a steady solution of the equations is an invariant measure. And those do not give the right answer. So that is a big deal. One way uh, suggested already by Kolmogorov is to add noise and then remove noise. And then uh, uh, supposedly stability will, will cure this problem. Uh, it's not something that we know how to do very well. And there is no theorem that I know that, uh, that removes them like that. So you can remove them by saying, I don't like them. Uh, but that's not going to uh, take you uh, very far if you do analysis. Another problem is if I have force Navier-Stokes equations, and part of this talk is about beware of forcing. This is also my conclusion. So um, then uh, this uh, epsilon, which is I call the fundamental uh, parameter, which originally was, again, in the case of unforced Navier-Stokes. It was a situation of the so-called decaying turbulence. Decaying turbulence doesn't mean necessarily decaying in time. There is uh, the typical example is flow past the grid, uniform flow past the grid. The turbulence occurs a few steps away from the grid for a few more steps away than the grid, and then laminarity uh, reestablishes itself further down. And uh, so there you have a time independent situation, and forcing means really essentially boundary conditions. So once you have body forces, then the balance of energy is this one. And then uh, the difference between these two guys, unless the energy for some reason is not bounded, which is not the case, uh, the difference between them ought to be zero. So uh, the meaning of this guy separately being bounded away from zero, uh, you can take that as a definition of uh, the zero law in the case of forcing. but. Uh, with a grain of salt. OK. So uh, I want to give you a, here an example, and I, I have a, a variety of reasons for giving it, um, of uh, a situation in which you can create very complex structures um, by forcing. And here is, is just an example. So you take an arbitrary open set in R3. You take a parameter. This parameter will be your power spectrum in the quote unquote the power spectrum. So a parameter between one and three, and then you produce a solution of Navier Stokes, which is smooth C0 infinity with a gradient smooth C0 infinity, meaning in arbitrary domains it's placed in there and doesn't touch the boundaries, such that the product between viscosity and gradient U square is bounded below independent. This is time independent. So it is bounded below, let's call it epsilon, as nil goes to zero. And moreover, there is a, an inertia scale between a dissipation scale and a, a input scale, such that dissipation wave number is proportional to a power of this viscosity, and uh, such that we have the Kolmogorov scale. And the, the number five thirds occurs as the, it's singled out, by uh, the requirement that the prefactor here, so there is a constant here in behind this little uh, um, um, snake, uh, that prefactor be independent of the size of the box in which the omega. So that's the only one 
then if you require that, you get five thirds by, by just algebra. And the force is smooth itself, uh, bounded, supported uh, in LP, uh, and P is in the sum range, uh, and then vanishes in, in sum range. So the um, solutions are obtained by, so one of the reasons was uh, to do the caveat about um, non-smooth non solutions, smooth solutions, and forcing, and having complex behavior. Uh, I'll mention, I'll belabor this. Uh, the reason I like it very much is uh, because of the Gavrilov solutions. So these are amazing things. So the Gavrilov solutions are solutions constructed by Gavrilov uh, that are axisymmetric solutions of Euler equations, no viscosity. Uh, exact solutions, smooth solutions with compact support. And these solutions are uh, have this form, there is a swirl. And um, they, um, they obey some ODE that, that allows them to be compact and supported. So we, we reconstructed them after, uh, after uh, uh, Gavrilov, understanding them uh, from the point of view that is, I think, the correct point of view from the, uh, for the axisymmetric situations, which is where they are, uh, in terms of the grad shafranov operator. Because uh, if you are in this situation, the grad shafranov if you are not even steady, but if you are uh, axisymmetric, the grad shafranov operator is intimately related to the uh, azimuthal component of the rear vorticity. So it appears naturally. And then you solve a certain semilinear equation with the Krat Shafranov, which is essentially here uh, um, looks like a Laplacian, except that the dimension n equals zero. Uh, <clears throat> and you solve the, the Krat Shafranov uh, with a, a plasma pressure, which is a, a, a function of uh, this function psi. And the main observation that is already due to Gavrilov is that if you have the property that u dot grad fluid pressure is zero, then you can localize uh, the equation. You can place it uh, in uh, small balls and you multiply by cutoff, and it's still a solution. So that's an amazing fact. And um, so in this particular case, the way we uh, write the equation, uh, this, because the plasma pressure is a function of the function psi, which is like, like a stream function, if you want, or uh, the, in plasma physics, it's called a flux function. So uh, P is a function of psi, and uh, then the requirement, this is, uh, the swirl is a function of psi, so the requirement that localizability is exactly that the speed of the particle be constant on isobars. So if you have that, then you localize. And once you, so this is a brilliant thing because now you can take these guys and put them anywhere, combine them anywhere. They don't talk to each other. They have superposition. So you can make a little necklace if you want and twist it in a Möbius band and put it on your wrist. And they are all solutions of oil. So then for the multi-scale, you take a basic one. So the caveat is that they're, they are really live in a, a, a connected, but not simply connected a domain. Actually, they live in a hollowed out annulus, the basic one. So you imagine that you stay at some distance from zero. So you're, you're in cylindrical coordinates, R and Z. R is uh, radius in the plane, Z is vertical. And you place yourself near the Z equals zero plane at some distance away and some distance away from the circle r equals one so that you don't hit zero. And then you have solutions, as I said, of the um, Euler equations that are compactly supporting this annulus. And um, the pressures are also compactly supported there. And then, then you start playing. So here I take a very simple game in which you take only one scale for the, velocity, the physical space and one scale for time. But you don't have to do that. You can do whatever scales you want. But if I have only one sequence of scales, so a little parameter, little l, little parameter, cap it, a little tau for time and space, and then you make the usual constructions, which are uh, have a velocity scale. So this is an outer scale of the l, some box size, and this is some time scale. 
and you get here these uh, amplitudes, then you rotate them, Rj is a rotation, and you, you can rotate them so that you're the, the center direction of Z that was vertical is now in your preferred direction of the day, and then you add them. So uh, I'll remark again that tau J is here, tau times J doesn't have to be time J, it has to, could be function of J, and L could be a function of J and can choose them as you or anybody else prescribes them to you. So then, the, uh, as I said, the, uh, you can sum them, their solutions. And in the example that I gave, uh, you stop the function, you al allow a certain rate between them, because I want to give a simple example, not because I have to. Uh, and so I put a rate little a that was in the theorem already, and then then uh, you stop at some point and de demand that the L2 norm of this guy doesn't blow up, but you say that the gradient of this blows up with L. And that's the game. And once you do that, you can produce whatever you want. And that was the time in which you can ask yourself, wait a minute. These were solutions of Euler. So where are the solution of Navier-Stokes? And now we reveal another secret in this business, which is one of the reasons why we say caveat, be careful of demanded forces. The force is the residual of the equation. So you say it's a solution of Navier-Stokes because I write Navier-Stokes minus, well, equals a force, and that's the difference. So uh, all these things are like that. When you hear there exists a force about Navier-Stokes that does this, there exists a force, you should be aware of that because uh, any function is a solution of Navier-Stokes. There exists a force. So the forces are uh, in the next page. I mean, I, I, this uh, I'm not going to belabor. I think that the only thing that I want to tell you is that in general, you get uh, some expressions for the, the spectrum. And then you, if you remind uh, yourself that you don't want this, this uh, to depend on uh, L, you, you get uh, exactly a certain number here for minus 5 thirds. It, it comes out that you only want, but it shouldn't be a surprise. And then the cutoff comes out to be the correct Kolmogorov cutoff in the case in which you get the correct Kolmogorov factor. They're just dimensional analysis, honestly. So there's not, no secret, there's no, no miracle. It's uh, not a deeper understanding. It's just simply saying that uh, there is only one way in which this exponent uh, doesn't involve the length. The corrections always involve extra length. Intermittency corrections, I mean. All right. <clears throat> so uh, before I go on, let me, let me finish here because I'm done. The forces are, as I said, the residual. I think I erased the, the, the I didn't want to go too far on this. So the forces are the residual and you can, okay, compute them because you have to take uh, your viscosity that you in, inserted there. What is the viscosity? Is the inverse of the gradient at the highest power n, right? So you have a sum, and I want the gradient squared times the viscosity to be one. So that's my viscosity. And once I know my viscosity, I can insert it and evaluate the Laplacian and see what happens. And uh, I told you in the theorem what happens. So that's the end of this. I don't. You can play with this. Uh, much more if you really are inclined, because you could, in principle, theoretically, if you want, take this to be time dependent and play with the time dependent forcing. You can put them on a fractal. You can do whatever you want. Okay, so you can do, in particular, try to to put in uh, multi-fractal scenarios, which I'm going to mention, but not in this context. So the force depends on viscosity. Absolutely. You do it without, I mean, with an independent force. No, 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 no. no. So I, I, I think, I think that if the if the force is if the the thing is uh, with a force independent of viscosity, then we are talking about much more serious uh, questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, this talk is about what we know and we don't know much. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the pressure. So the, 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 another message of this talk would be that there are a few important objects in this theory and or in this business. And one of them 
is a little bit neglected is depression. So there, there, <laughs> there, another one that I'm going to mention is the structure function. So they're a little bit neglected. So not a lot neglected, but a little bit neglected. So I want to remind you about the pressure. What's nice about the pressure? So, uh, well, uh, the pressure equation is a nice equation if you knew velocity. Uh, there is no natural boundary condition. This is the whole space. Uh, and if the pressure wasn't there, the pressure is a driver, then I would have a maximum principle for Navier-Stokes equation. So it will be essentially diagonal. And uh, then uh, you no know, singularity problem. So you have multi-depurgus. There is no, no singularity, viscous purgus. So there is no singularity there. In addition, uh, the pressure is non-sensitive to regularizing this equation with a nice operator that commutes with taking the divergence. So I can put here Laplace into 14. I have a perfectly good uh, solution for all time, even with forces that are given to me. And the pressure equation is the same. As long as uh, I don't introduce divergences from the forcing or boundary condition. OK, so it's a very important object. And then, um, then let's go back to, to the concept of intermittency from the point of view of the sparsity. So for mathematicians, what intermittency should mean simply that you, uh, you have to take care of the order in which you take integrals in space and time. So powers, integrals, they don't commute. OK, so you can take a power, take one integral, take another power, take another kind of integral. That's all these things uh, are important and they don't commute. So in this business, for weak solutions of Navier-Stokes, there are high derivative results uh, that go back to the 80s. And HM is the good old solar space based on L2. So m derivatives in L2. This is the exponent. As you notice, as m goes larger, this exponent goes down. Uh, in particular, uh, um, and uh, these guys already uh, referred to Luc Tartar. They actually, uh, uh, Colette Guillaume just told me not, not long ago in the Midwest PD seminar that they offered uh, no co-authorships to Luc, and he didn't uh, want it. So anyway, uh, he noticed that as a consequence of this, uh, the um, integral in time of maximum velocity is finite. And that means how far can I ballistically throw my turbulence? So you cannot throw it far. OK, so if I start, a, um, let's imagine a, a, a turbulence that is without boundary conditions. So I'm not going to worry about that. It's periodic. But I put uh, everything in a box somewhere and ask myself after t minutes what, how far it is. It cannot be farther than, than this place here. OK, so there are other conditions. Uh, um, the gradients in bounded, right? So this implies that almost everywhere in time, the gradients are bounded, OK? Which, if they were not almost everywhere in time and there were, this power was 1, even Euler would have been good. OK, so there's, the difference between 1 half and 1 is worth a million dollars to some people. So, um, and there is, these are powers that are not pleasant. They're, they're not convex, uh, locally convex spaces if I go with powers less than one. But there are also uh, Laplacian to power four thirds. And here is uh, our friend. And actually, uh, I think that both authors here are in, in the room. Um, so, um, I, I, I did this by using the vorticity, and Pierre Louis put it in his book with uh, learning with Lorentz spaces, and Lorentz spaces uh, go almost <coughs> all the way, but they don't. So, uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's a problem for the audience, uh, to, uh, and I uh, don't suggest it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So intermittency and regularity is a subject that it was not invented uh, for this talk. So there is a long series of works of Grusch and collaborators. 
uh, they go in physical space and assume essentially that if you stick your at a place, you stick your finger out some distance, you see blue sky. Okay, that's sparsity in physical space. You have regions of very intense behavior of some gradient. And you look in a ball around the point where it's very intense. And at distance one, let's say, away or L away from that, you can find with non-zero probability regions in which the gradient is slow. And that's essentially the physical interpretation or the, the mental interpretation of what really sparsity means. It's done very concretely. And the, uh, the theorems are hard to, to um, essentially they're conditional con regularity results that say that the gap, this huge gap between one half and one or between zero and one that we have in various exponents uh, goes down as you assume um, intermittency in the sense sparse upper level sets, uh, you assume them for higher and higher derivatives. And then if you assume them uh, in a scale growing up of very derivatives, the gap goes down. And that's essentially the, and they have also results for hyperviscous, any hyperviscous of the same ilk. So they, there is no, uh, now on the other hand, so this is one way of thinking of intermediate regularity. On the other hand, uh, Alexei and Roman, Roman is here, uh, they studied conditions based on little with Paley components. You do a little with Paley decomposition and you look at the Bernstein inequalities and you ask yourself, uh, are they um, reversed? Are they uh, fulfilled? In other words, are they sharp? And uh, you can introduce their uh, level of unsharpness of them and that's related to the in intermittency dimension or they define an intermittent dimension. And if uh, the intermittency is not too brutal, then you are regular. And intermittency being brutal, for instance, the most brutal intermittency is Kolmogorov, in which there is uh, no, no blue sky. So these are known results. Uh, and they, they give you already a landscape of where you are, because these are results on weak solutions. So uh, weak solutions are a concept that is, in my mind, temporary. So it is not the final concept for turbulence, but it is uh, an existing concept. So let's go from weak to strong. So uh, these are sufficient conditions for regularity. And I'm going to see in a second, I'm going to mention them, and I'm going to start talking about them. By the way, when, when do I uh, have to finish here? At four? So let's, let's hope. Um, so <clears throat> here are the famous Ladezhenskaya Prodi Serin. I didn't used to use uh, Ladezhenskaya's name, but I was convinced. So uh, I used also to mention uh, Foyash. So anyway, so these are conditions that say uh, if in physical space, this is the exponent in physical space, uh, Q is larger than three and you have in time uh, this condition, so 2 over p plus 3 over q equals 1, or, or of course, uh, a better is also uh, are, all right, then you get regularity. So assume this, and then you get regularity. Uh, belonging to this space doesn't mean you are independent of viscosity. That means that quantity is finite for given viscosity. For all, so if you start with an initial data, on that path, as long as that quantity is finite, you are regular. For, in particular, for instance, if you take uh, uh, this uh, Q to be infinity and you are allowed because it's not three, uh, then uh, P becomes two and you see the difference between uh, this thing and the result of tartar where the exponent was one, okay? So uh, if this would have been, the exponent would have been two, you're done, okay? So the solution is infinite. For Q equals three, it's uh, uh, the same condition because uh, if you take Q equals three, then you get uh, here P equals infinity. It requires you the L3 norm to be finite. And this is uh, Escariaza, Seriogin, and Schwerer. And it's a very different uh, kind of condition. So we're gonna mention that a little bit. In terms of pressure, um, because I said the pressure is the orphan here, there are fewer results known, and one uh, is the L2 in time L3, 
which really for pressure will be like uh, the condition on vorticity, it's L6 for velocity, and L6 to the power 4 rhymes with vorticity to the power 4, and that's not. So, um, okay, and uh, you can do L6 to the power 4 from here. Two, and that's now. So it runs with that, and it's a very, of course, easy to prove. If this is happens, then you're okay. And this is a uh, Berceli and Galdi uh, all time. And there are results uh, in, that are interesting on side lower bounds in L infinity, but both in space and time for the pressure. So um, let me give you some examples of what I really am interested in. So this is the uh, quantitative versions of Ladezhenska serin project. And it says, let's take the Q larger than three case, and let's give it a name to the integral that's supposed to be finite. So we call it mq because now uh, p is determined from q, right, by the Ladezhenska problem. You give it a name mq, and then you get an explicit expression for the h1 norm. Just con control the extreme norm. And it's explicit, meaning mq is here, right? And the rest are parameters that I know, initial data and the viscosity. So conditional on knowing what you're talking about, the new, the initial data and the condition, you have an answer. So I call these accessible. And I'm going to explain now the meaning of the word accessible is local to the talk. Accessible means it is a condition that implies regularity. It is a condition that is explicit in terms of parameters. In other words, the condition itself enters, and that's it. I assume it. I observe it. But more importantly, it is a condition that implies regularity on solutions that approximate only weakly the solution. So you take a system of approximants, let's say the Lure approximation or Galerkin or any method that vortex methods, uh, uh, there was the vortex blob method in, in Laurel's talk, um, which regularized a little bit the integrant. So <clears throat> all these methods have the property that after passing to subsequence and there is some compactness, the convergence is uh, almost everywhere. So U of X and T, Sub new or sub or new converges to u of x and t almost everywhere in x and t. And it has uh, uh, some other properties, but that's the only one that you can use here. And by fa2, you get that in the limit, your solution of the weak solution obeys the same bounds. And then the theorem says, oh, but that was a regular solution then. So that's what I mean by accessible. It is valid for approximations in situations in which you normally don't know yet the answer and the approximant converges only weakly. So uh, not all of the, uh, uh, and they, they, I think they're useful. So ideally, we don't have that yet. Ideally, what you'd like to do, and that would be the best accessible, super nicely accessible, would be that it is enough to compute this kind of quantity, not only, or only that I'm computing it on approximations and assuming that's uniformly valid, independent. Let's imagine that the index of the approximation is capital N, and that's my nth approximation. So this statement here requires this object on UN to be bounded by the same number for all N. Okay, ideally, you would like to say there exists a relationship between N and new and time so that it is enough to check it for that N. OK, so some things like that exist in some, but those imply stability. Those are, or they don't imply it, but they require it. OK, so if you are in a situation, there are examples of con uh, co conditions like that. You have a, a stable solution of steady solution, and it's stable spectrally of, let's say, Navier-Stokes even, force Navier-Stokes. And uh, you measure an approximant. And you know the radius. We know that the, the uh, radius of stability of the solution is blah. And then you can detect that with finite uh, computations. All right. So the reason why I did only H1 here, you see, I'm because you have, uh, uh, once you are in H1 in this business, you are everywhere. So you have propagation of regularity. 
So if you are here, then if you ask me, oh, but I want the third derivative in L, uh, L6. Well, I can tell you from this quantity exactly, again, accessible. Computationally, you can find out the prediction. It could be uh, more nasty exponentials, but it's explicit. No, no implicit, not depending on the weak solution. Okay, so let me repeat that a million times. The bounds that people claim to be quantitative and they require you to insert points in the weak solution, for instance, a weak solution, as I mentioned before, there are bounds for the weak solution of this type. Are you coming back? It doesn't, doesn't want to go back. Okay, maybe it tells me something. Never mind, doesn't want to go back. Never mind. So uh, you remember the gradient to one power, uh, one half power integrated in time tells you that the gradient is finite. You know, time interval, if I take an approximate, I have these bounds, I can find points in time where I can place myself and the gradient is finite, less than something. Okay, that depends on the weak solution. The choice of the times depends on the weak solution. And if that choice is implemented, you don't have an accessible result. You tell me that it goes like some something, but I personally wonder that if I do a different computation, I take a different choice, how is that constant going to depend? <coughs> okay? <coughs> so for the pressure, the natural uh, uh, analog of the Seryogin uh, sphere of result, uh, result would be the three halves power of the pressure to be bounded. So we, uh, I don't have that. I have a, a, a weaker version. So there exists a constant such that if I take the pressure and I define the pressure in terms of free transform so I don't have ambiguity about constants. So this is, let's say, in periodic boundary domains, these are operators that are multipliers by the unit wave, wave number in direction j, or in the whole space are some explicit integrals or still that. So uh, that's uh, a choice for the pressure. And then for that uh, pressure, if you find the number delta such that you have this sort of quantitative absolute continuity, if a set has measure less than delta, then the integral of that object to the power three halves is less than viscosity cube. Okay? So this is uh, the condition. In, in particular, if P would have been uh, uh, in L3 uniformly, then, then uh, this thing is, uh, um, so in, in the, the, the problem is that uniformity in, is not depending on only the L3 norm, okay? For an individual function P, if uh, it's integrable, of course, it's, uh, this integral goes to zero, but it might depend on the function, not there won't be this uniformity that the number here, delta, depends on nothing, okay? In particular, it doesn't depend on time. So it's sort of like L infinity of unit. It's, it's a uniform absolute continuity, but it's with finest amount, not, uh, I'll repeat, repeat that, okay? So this is accessible because it implies other powers, so powers larger than, than three. So once I have this power, this three halves, I can go to UL3, and this, I know that this is uh, Ladezhenskaya's same prodi. I know how to compute from here that MQ, and I get uh, everything expressed. So it's accessible. The condition is weaker than uniform integrability because this is a fixed number. I don't get for every epsilon a delta. I have the delta for this epsilon. I need it, okay? So uh, it leads to explicit quantity, okay? So for, uh, you can do Ladezhenska prodiserine, which is the corresponding power is here to Q over Q minus three for given Q larger than three half, and you get uh, the same result. That's not a big deal. Q is uh, infinity is allowed. So it tells you again, this looks like U square. So this is L infinity of pressure, which is the normal thing. You would be like U square. So it, it, it's stronger than U square if you want. So now I want to talk a little bit about structure functions. So I, I'm, I'm gonna try in 10 minutes to cover a little more ground. And uh, in fact, this is only one theorem, but there are applications of this particular theorem. 
So uh, structure functions are, as we said before, they are increments over a distance. I call this capital S2 and keep in mind this capital S2. This is the average of the displacement with a measure that goes down to zero. Now you have to remember that um, classical turbulence says that there is a cutoff. So below that cutoff, the function u is supposed to be smooth. So this thing here has no cutoff, but it requires this quantity to be finite. And um, we'll discuss this. So uh, there is a parameter r. And we are, uh, parameter is r is simply how far uh, away uh, we displace. And the theorem is exactly like before. And actually, in fact, this is the theorem behind. There is a delta, and there is an r that depends on time. So for each time, I'm allowed to change how far I use the displacements, as long as this doesn't go to zero too terribly in time. So the negative fourth power is fine. And then if that, these two parameters are given to you, and you have the property of finite integrability, that the integral on sets of size at most delta is less than mu cube, then on zero t, then the solution is smooth. So this is the really the, the correct analog of S3. So this is accessible. So it implies bounds for LQ, that in this bounds, you see the integral of r to minus 4, and you see the delta. So these two parameters enter, enter explicitly. They are the ones that you assume that are finite, and then the LQ norm comes out explicit, and then everything is explicit. So why power 4? Well, it comes from the analysis. Power 4 is really the integrability of the uh, Kolmogorov dissipation length. So that if you remember, that had some epsilon to one quarter at some point, an epsilon to one quarter, or epsilon to minus a quarter, uh, it's uh, gradient u squared to one quarter. And that's, that's the, the scale. So let's give some examples. <laughs> One is that you assume that you have a function, a profile, and that the displacement in the profile in L3 uh, goes like some power. So um, positive power. So this uh, doesn't require the function itself to be in L3, but uh, requires only the increment to be in L3. Okay, so you can have functions like uh, very slowly decaying. Okay. Uh, and uh, then uh, you compute what my condition is. The integral on A should be computable. I have the assumption, so I know how to compute. I get, uh, again, the power S coming up. And remember, this L could be time dependent. So you assume a profile that has a finite Reynolds number at scale L, and then you discover uh, this condition that L should go down to zero, not too violently. And it's the same condition as the Kolmogorov cutoff. So if you have these two conditions, that uh, the scale doesn't go to zero too violently, and the Reynolds number at scale L is bounded by some number, then you are regular. These are all actually applications of the previous theorem or, or the method of proof. <laughs> a Dini condition is something easier to state. You take the displacement at scale y, and you assume that there are some modulus of continuity. And now if I take it in L3, I will assume that this modulus of continuity is time independent. And you assume then the modulus of continuity has some integrability, a Dini condition. And then you uh, have regularity. And the Dini condition here, you can have a log to minus alpha, where alpha is larger than one half. So you have regularity. So this is an application of the previous theorem for L3. Uh, if you want for the addition scale prodi, so then, then there is time allowed, because Q is not three. And then you have a similar condition with a time-dependent modulus of continuity. And this modulus of continuity has to have in LQ now has to have some integrability in time after you, you do this. And again, you have logarithmic conditions here. That, and Q is infinity is allowed as before because it's much larger than three. And uh, uh, this is the condition for that. All right. 
I won't have time for much more, but I want to do one more. So, oh, region, I'm doing two more. Uh, this is regions of interest. So this is regions in which it's a, again an application. You look at regions where velocity is high and the gradient are high. And then the assumptions are the cutoff, right? So there is a cutoff for, for R because I'm going to integrate on a ball of radius R. So uh, integrability like Kolmogoro scale, velocity, integrability like you know what, and gradient to power one, like you know what, because all these are classical conditions. The last one is for, for uh, Euler even. Then you have regularity. So, but then again, it's a it's a integrability condition of these quantities. Mm -hmm. Okay, and finally, the multifractural scenario that I want to mention. So, I, I think that I'm going to skip other things. So, <clears throat> what's a multifractural scenario? You are assuming now these are little s twos, which are the honest increments undivided um, by a measure in y. You are you are doing this only on the unit sphere, an average on the unit sphere. That uh, you're displaced by y, at the, uh, and the displacement size is r. So then this is a function of time, of course, and r, and location where you are. So you assume that wherever you look, you have an exponent, positive exponent. I'm assuming it's positive, and, and fractal amounts, physicists select uh, also negative ones, but um, let's, let's talk um, regularity. So, you assume a positive exponent that depends on x. So then capital S2, once alpha is positive, you pick up one over alpha of x. So that's the effect, uh, really, of capital S2 versus little s2. It's an important one, but it's clear here. So in the multifractor uh, intermittent scenario, you assume that there is a spectrum of near singularities of this type, and that uh, size h, h for alpha, uh, no, this is dying, dying on me. Alpha of x is um, of order h on a set that depends on h and has dimension d of h. So many fractals. And they occur with some probability, mu of h. All right, so let's see if I can go more. I can. All right, so imagine this turbulence. So there is no real singularities, but you are oh, tasting this. So suppose around. Uh, sigma of h, you have a region, and you partition it in small disjoint cubes of some size. And then the multifractural assumption is that how many of these I have? I have rho to minus d of h, whatever d of h was. And then these occur with probability. So alpha of x is assumed to be larger or equal to h, equal to h in that cube. So then you can compute. And the S2 based on some radius R, R0, goes like so, with this h to minus 1, because I'm doing the capital S2. And the integral on the domain, you simply start counting how many you have. You have the number of them, because you assume multifractality. And then you implement this condition of 3 halves. And you get some integral with the probability distribution that you assume. And then if you compute out of uh, the multifactor scenario, what is zeta p, the p uh, component is done by a Legendre uh, 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 dual. So the Legendre transform of, of uh, this exponent, it's a most effective thing. And in particular, it tells me that the 3 halves power here goes with exponent z3, zeta p. If that is positive, I'm regular. So you can construct them. And you can construct them by hand using Gavrilov tapes and produce scenarios that are multifractal and they have uh, regularity. All right. So I'm not going to talk about the Euler equations because I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop with my, I'm not going to talk about them because I'm out of time. I'm going to just give you, uh, oh, let me give you this remark. So if the Hessian of the pressure, it blows up like one over T squared and the rate of blow up is less than one, then there was no blow up. That's one of the, the results, okay? So this is a result with uh, Dongo Che a couple of years ago. Anyway, so localized and so forth. Proof, no, no proofs. No, I'm gonna go to the conclusions, which are very simple. So beware of manufactured forces, please. 
But long-time statistics are the main issue. So long-time statistics require you to force, you have your stocks regularize, force, and dissipate. So beware, but uh, there is only one game in town, except that it would be nice to do decaying turbulence behind a, um, a grid. There exists regularity condition that permit multi-scale and even multi-fractal scenarios, and those might be what is happening. And for oil equations, I didn't talk, but the bond on one well-chosen component of Hessian pressure implies regularity. <laughs> I want to come back here to the original uh, long-time statistic. What we would like to do is to recognize that on average, typically, based on the, the, the proofs that we have already, typical solutions are regular. So, uh, and we would like to construct invariant measures that are robust, and they recognize the fact that they, they, they reflect the fact that on average, the solutions are regular. So, thank you. Questions? Um, when you uh, say uh, regularity, uh, in your uh, talk, we present uh, a symphony regularity. But uh, for Navier Stocks, uh, we have uh, analytic regularity uh, solution. And uh, the, uh, gap, uh, the, the gap between a symphony and uh, uh, analytic regularity is uh, is very large because the analytic class is very uh, is a rigid class of function, and uh, th there is uh, some possibility to uh, to interpret. Uh, I don't know, but uh, the uh, that uh, the good regularity with that we uh, will see is uh, analytic. There is something like this. Uh... So um, once the conditions don't forbid it. So suppose you do periodic boundary conditions or the whole space. So you don't put this thing in a domain that has Lipschitz boundaries, but you put it in a domain with, let's say, analytic boundaries, real analytic boundaries. Then the conditions of regularity go all the way to analyticity. So there is not, we mentioned T infinity because we didn't want to bother. So there are conditions. So analyticity is implied already by Ladezhenska, uh, uh, saying Prodi, uh, L infinity squared. And actually, in the work of Gruzic, he uses that. He uses in a very strong quantitative version, analyticity. OK. OK? So you give me L square of uh, velocity, uh, L, and, and maximum velocity squared, and you integrate that in time, you gave me analyticity. OK. OK, so there is no gap. I mean, if there is the same gap. Yes, OK. Yes, thank no you. further gap. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, there, there was Dallas. I saw Dallas, and I saw Stephen. <laughs> so we talked a lot about Navier Stokes blow up. But do you think uh, that uh, anomalous dissipation is driven by uh, Euler blow ups? Do I think that what's uh, anomalous dissipation is driven by Euler blow ups? when you take inviscid limit? OK, so yes and no. So what do I mean by that? The, 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 the thing that I, I think, I still think it, is that as Euler wants to blow up, um, what does it do? It, it uh, sends you vortex tubes close to each other, discussing that doesn't like that, and then rearranges them, like the heat equation would. It rearranges them, it flattens them, becomes actually some bizarre things, and then rearranges them, and that's called a dissipative event, boom, uh, and uh, it's a regularizing mechanism. So are the singularities, finite time, real singularities Euler uh, needed? No. What is needed as creation of small scales, small enough, and 
incoherent enough for Viscoins to say, I oh, know I don't like this. Okay, so yes and no. Then I mean, with, from the point of view of singularities, if you ask, uh, uh, please don't. The man in the street, how <laughs> was the difference between e to the e to the e to the t or uh, uh, and uh, finite blow up? Uh, the man in the street who knows uh, um, read Archimedes uh, says uh, uh, no difference really. I mean, for us, it's all the same. Um, don't ask a combinatorialist because they have towers of e to the e to the t to the power e to the t, but that's uh, them. Now, the man in the street won't, won't like that. Beautiful talk, Peter. So just to follow up on the remark you made at the end there, this time dependence of decaying turbulence behind the grid, just if you could make a few comments on uh, what was expected or what's interesting about that. And then the second thing would be, if one looks beyond scaling exponents and it goes to perhaps structure functions, scaling functions associated with turbulence, where are the observed experimental structure functions for which this young audience might be interested to aim as the target to explain? So uh, if I understood correctly, uh, my, my, uh, what is expected for the time dependent? Uh, um, Behind the flowing grid. Maybe. This is a recorded talk, so I don't know what's expected. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, the structure functions. I mean, you, you see the uh, there. Usually, what happens in experimental physics? People um, tabulate their results in various ways. And there are plots. Uh, they usually, they do histograms of certain types and plots of uh, uh, exponents. So uh, all these things need to be assimilated in some manner. But uh, I don't think that people made a 3D plot of uh, um, you know x and t versus uh, s and three. But so I, I don't think that they are available. They could be available. I don't think in itself. So the the, the obsession with Scaling exponents comes from uh, very good reasons in statistical physics where they, they have uh, a significant meaning. And here, too, these are robust numbers that need to be explained. And uh, uh, there are low level explanations by scaling and variance and so forth. Um, and then there are higher level explanations, which are proofs. So that's what's important. And uh, I don't know of um, um, surrogate. That. No, we the recording. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I hope I interpreted the results uh, in the middle of your talk correctly that uh, you relax the regularity conditions in the sense that they just need to hold up to a certain scale which depends on viscosity and in a certain, you know, I mean, in, in sufficiently many time and space spots. But then, so that, that looks very physical, but then the final result which you got out of it was kind of this exponential expansivity of a supercritical norm, the H1 norm, for instance. But couldn't you relate what you were doing also, I mean, make it, you know, make the output also more physical in the sense of saying, when I have these conditions, it gives me somehow this cutoff scale KD and beyond KD, I have exponential decay. Mm. So uh, rephrase, I mean, not just kind of trying to make the assumption more physical, but also the output more, you know, closer to the idea of then after your inertial range, you get, uh, you know, you get uh, a boring spectrum. I, I think that some version of what you're saying might be possible. So because um, if you assume what I'm doing, in reality, uh, how do you prove it? In the reality, you hide something in a decaying thing. So if you are really interested now to uh, uh, estimate the decay below that, maybe uh, it's also a consequence. Now, uh, don't ask me to do Reynolds number independent. So the idea would be to do a Reynolds, uh, uh, the local Reynolds number to be one and below that to, to go uh, exponentially down. So I don't know, some version of that might be possible, okay? But uh, 
obviously the results for the 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 gradient itself are Reynolds number dependent. These are not uh, Reynolds number independent. They are not in the limit. So in order to get these results in the limit, we have to assume something also about the limit. So we have to assume some uniform in viscosity bounds. For instance, assuming that these conditions are uh, uniform, then you would get maybe something inside that is uh, uniform. So if I assume my delta, for instance, to be independent of viscosity inside, I can get, so, yeah. More questions? Hi, was there a connection between the uh, the regularity criterion, which is about the infimum of the pressure in space and time by Sergin and uh, Sverak, and your condition on the Hessian of pressure? Um, um, I, there is, okay, so there is no formal condition the, uh, the, um, on the Hessian of pressure? You have one Hessian, right? I have, okay, so Sergin and Sverak is not yet Stokes. Hessian of pressure is Euler. So it's a different, uh, it's a different animal. But um, but Serogin and Schwerak are about interesting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, events that are, are blow-up events and they are forbidden by this condition. So in terms of scaling, it's not the correct scaling because it's a, a space-time in, uh, L infinity, which is way so. If you want the connection is that if I assume L infinity, you saw I have a condition integral in time of pressure in L infinity is enough. So that would be a generalization in the sense that you refer to the Serogin sphere of being L infinity bound, but it's only one sign. Thank you. More. More fun. I'm very glad you were asked about the Asian of pressure. So, because you just skip the the slides, so could you show it? Uh... Oh, you know, I mean, I, 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 you have to deal with these people after this. So, oh, you cannot, yeah, yeah, you don't know how to go back, right? Yeah, no, and it's hard to go back. But I, I, <laughs> well, I can from the screen. I mean, it's really easy to do this. I can go back on the screen, but you, uh, okay. So, uh, raise off, raise hands if you want to see it. Yeah, yeah, just see. <laughs> Uh, 50 50. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'll tell you, it's very simple. I can tell you the proof. The proof is very simple. So essentially, it requires you. Do I have this? Here's a statement. So it's a, a triple <laughs> integral. It, this is one vector. This is another vector. This is the Hessian of the pressure. To take the negative part of that, integrate, 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 and you want finite. Okay, so that implies a version thing. Now, theta is the unit vector in the direction of stretching of vorticity, the time derivative of vorticity normalized. This is what this notation is. So in order to explain that to you, I need to remind you that the vorticity stretch, so the vorticity stretching equation, the S equation is like this. Or this is stretching equation. So S is a symmetric part. And then, so you assume that the scalar product between the Hessian applied to the direction of vorticity, uh, dot is, so the cosine between the Hessian applied in the direction of vorticity and the direction of the stretching of vorticity, its negative part is bounded in this weird way. And then you get regularity. So the reason is very simple and uh, these are the remarks that I mentioned that uh, this is, of course, less than the norm of the matrix and therefore the norm of the matrix Hessian. Uh, and uh, this condition implies this condition because I have an exponential of a log with a power less than one. Yeah, but so, so the, if the Hessian is bounded uh, from, be, from above, you, uh... So maybe you have the simpler condition. Maybe. So there is a blow up and the low. So essentially, I have something else. The, yeah, this one, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I have something, the, the, this one. So if the this pressure is, uh, Hessian is positive long enough, it blows up. This is an older result. If the, so this is simply, if the pressure doesn't oppose the effect of stretching at all, 
then then uh, there is finite time law. It's an order result. But if there's pressure, so it's a, it's a weird situation. But that's that's life. So it's alignment condition, right? Hmm? So it's condition on alignment. Yes, it's a it's a certain by the dynamic alignment with uh, special objects. Yes. Well, thanks for the for the talk. Uh, I mean, just to remind, so I mean, uh, I, I find it very interesting this notion of uh, accessibility. All the examples that you gave seems to be basically a situation where the viscosity is dominant. Basically, that I mean that you you can balance, you find the right balance with respect to new of controlling the, the pressure term or transport term with respect to. It, 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 do you think that this notion could be pushed to a situation where? Uh, uh, you don't have that, or it's really the only situation where we can expect this kind of thing, that we have this kind of strong uh, um, stability result uh, or regularity result uniform with, with things because, because we're always in a regime when the viscosity... So dominates. what are you trying to ask me? If you can do this without viscosity? That's what you're having. Uh, 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 if you want to have, no, I mean, a different regime, right? Because basically, regime when you, you that end up not just saying, well, I can deplete my uh, my uh, pressure term of this amount that is controlled by viscosity. I mean, it seems that this smallness, of course, you put the new, but uh, 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 smallness, which means the viscosity dominate. All right, so. I, I said this is recorded, so uh, can we stop recording? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh